Uh, today, I'm going to talk a bit about transparent research and other topics. When I was invited to give this keynote, they told me that the topic that you've chosen this year for the symposium is transparency. And I gave this a great deal of thought. Um, and then in fact, I also uh, received some questions from you. So I'll, I'll start a little bit by defining my terms. You don't have to agree with me on these definitions. I start with definitions usually when I speak or when I write so that you can understand what I mean by the words and concepts. Um, I often start by looking at the dictionary and I took a look at transparency to start. Uh, and here's what I found in Merriam-Webster's, which is the desk dictionary that's the most widely used among academic publishing houses and journals. Transparency is a noun. It refers to the quality or state of being transparent. Something also refers to something transparent, especially, for example, a picture as on film viewed by light shining through it or by projection. Synonyms include clarity, clearness, limpidity, lucency, translucence, and translucency. Antonyms, the opposites are cloudiness, opacity, opaqueness, turbidity. The definition of transparent means having the property of transmitting light without appreciable scattering so that bodies lying beyond are seen clearly, allowing the passage of a specified form of radiation, such as x-rays or ultraviolet light. That which is fine or sheer enough to be seen through diaphanous, free from pretense or deceit, and in research, this is one of the key definitions. Easily detected or seen through, obvious, readily understood, again, important for research. Characterized by visibility or accessibility of information, especially concerning business practices. Synonyms, clear, crystal, crystalline, Limpid, lucent, pellucid. Now, uh, when you start to look for synonyms, clarity, transparency, means being capable of being seen through. Clear, the absence of cloudiness, haziness or muddiness. to be so clear that things can be seen distinctly. Now, when we're talking about transparency in research, then you've got to ask, what do we mean by research? And for this, I look to Mario Bunge, the great physicist and philosopher of science who died recently at the age of 101. Bunke speaks about research as the method, methodical search for knowledge. Original research tackles new problems or checks previous findings. Rigorous research is the mark of science, technology, and the living branches of the humanities. It is typically absent from pseudoscience and ideology. Synonyms include exploration, 
investigation, inquiry. Now, Munke goes a little bit further to talk about research programs and research projects. A research program is a system of research projects. All the projects in such a program have the same basic hypotheses and the findings of every project constitute an input to another project in the same program. A sound research program is self-sustained. For example, biochemistry is the result of the research program consisting in unveiling the chemical composition, structure, and function of the constituents of living things. On the other hand, he points out, human sociobiology is a failed research program of attempting to explain every bit of human behavior in human biological terms. There is no psychoanalytical research program because psychoanalysts, psychoanalysts do not investigate. He says, likewise, there is no UFO research project, let alone program. There's only a collection of alleged UFO sightings. And then he says, as for parapsychology research, it doesn't constitute a program because it has no findings that suggest further problems to be investigated. When he talks about research projects, and this is something of value to doctoral students, especially because most of you are doing a research project of some kind, he says, in general, one starts research by picking a domain of facts or ideas. And then you make or take for granted some general assumptions about them. You collect a body of extant knowledge about the domain. You decide on an aim. And in the light of these, you pick or invent the proper method. A research project may be sketched as an ordered quintuple. The general assumptions of a scientific research project include the hypotheses that the items to be investigated are material, lawful, and scrutable, as opposed to immaterial, for example, the supernatural, lawless, or inscrutable. Research projects are grounded on background knowledge, but ultimately they're justified only by success. And now comes the challenge, which I'm here to talk about this evening. How do we achieve transparent research? In one way, the issues are simple, but like many simple things, they're difficult to do because they require learning, knowledge, experience, and skill. We acquire skill through repeated practice, cycles of development, growth, failure, and success. I'm gonna take a minute to examine the cycle of experiential development. No matter what it is that we set out to achieve, we're incompetent when we start. At first, we don't know what we don't know. That's the state of unconscious incompetence. Even though we want to do something, even though we want to learn something, we don't know things. And most of the time, we don't even know what we don't know. You know, when I look at, um, when I look at the, the Olympic skiers, for example, I always give this example. When I look at the Olympic skiers, it's so easy. They just start up at the top of the slope and they go downhill. Well, the first time I tried to ski, I couldn't even stay on the skis. It was, I was a complete disaster. I had no idea because it looked so easy on TV. They just hop out of the gate. Whoosh, and I thought, well, okay. I mean, Olympic skiers, I didn't expect to be an Olympian. Um, they go fast. They have real skill. But I thought, oh, well, it, it, it looks so easy. I might not be able to perform at an Olympic level, but certainly I can ski. Well, I was completely wrong. I couldn't ski. 
I still can't ski. I, I spent a lot of time in the snow. So we don't know what we don't know. That is the state of unconscious incompetence. We don't know things and we don't even know that we don't know them. If we're smart, we learn that we don't know what we need to know. Now we've moved from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence. And this is a sign of intelligence, not a sign of stupidity. From time to time, I've been on discussion groups where someone will ask a reasonable question online. Every now and then someone with a bit of experience will fire off a post to proclaim that the question is stupid. That's nonsense. There are no stupid questions. Questions are the way we learn what we don't know. Now, once we reach the state of conscious incompetence, this allows us to ask questions and to learn. As we learn, we develop. As we begin to develop the skills we require, we move into a state of conscious competence. We are aware of what we know, but we have to pay attention at every moment to do well. Finally, with enough practice, we move to the state of unconscious competence. We simply carry out our activities without thinking about them. Now, learning to drive a car is a good example of this progression. You know, the first time I tried to drive a car, um, I would try to shift the gears, nothing would work, the car would stop. And I really had to pay attention. Uh, finally, I started to get the hang of it. And I could, I could drive places, but I still had to pay enormous attention to everything. You know, watch the traffic, see what's going on, check the mirrors, see what's going on in front of me, see what's going on behind me. But I could go places. It was terrific. And when I did this long enough, I became unconsciously competent. I would get in the car. Maybe I would get in the car. I'd be talking with a friend. We'd be going somewhere. And all of a sudden, I'd be there. And we, I've been talking with my friend the whole time. And I'd be where I planned to go. And I didn't even remember how I got there. The process just took care of itself. With many skills, we repeat this cycle many times, each time at a higher level. Now, there's only so, well, actually, when you go someplace new with a car, you, you have to pay attention to the map and where you're going. So there's a little bit of this. But with things like research, you have to go through the process many times. And every time you do it, you're beginning again and you're consciously incompetent at a higher level than you were the last time, so that you slowly move upward. Now, this probably seems like a lot of background, but to my way of thinking, this background provides the foundation for transparent research. Research involves a number of key skills. These include the key skills of research itself, with methods and methodology, critical thinking, reasoning, and all the rest. In addition, there are key skills that you need to communicate research. This is really important to you guys who are writing your doctoral thesis, because you've got to do the research, and then you've got to be able to communicate the research that you did to explain it and make it clear to other people. Uh, a friend of mine in Norway had a motto that I always liked. He said, there's only two kinds of research, perfect research and published research. Perfect research is never published and published research is never perfect. Well, your doctoral thesis is gonna be your first major publication. And it's not going to be perfect, but you want to make it as solid as you can so that 
it gives you the beginning of your next work and your next work and your next work. Now, the key skills that you need to communicate research involve several issues. Some of them don't specifically, I'm gonna point to several. Some of these skills don't specifically cover academic writing and publishing, but to focus on the key skills you need to write well, that is to make things transparent. Others focus on methods that are relevant to a genre of academic writing, such as case study or literature review. Some focus on related issues that you'll need to become involved with, such as peer review or doing presentations at conferences and seminars. So we have copyright and intellectual property, citation and reference, the question of plagiarism and how to avoid it, critical thinking and reasoning, case study, literature review, presentation, peer review, referencing, research writing. And now we get to the crucial items you need to consider crucial elements in publishing and presenting your research. Voice, who is speaking? Tone, what's the nature or quality of the person who speaks? Stop. Style, what's the best way to write academic prose? What's the best way to narrate research? Now these issues um, are actually the subject of, a, of an enormous amount of debate. And to be transparent, you gotta think about these issues and make clear choices. Um, I see a lot of the debates that I, I observe, uh, especially in design research, um, tend to be a little bit, I would say, cranky or immature. Um, for example, people say, well, now I'm, I'm going to do research, so I'm going to speak for myself, and here's the way I'm going to do it. Or they rehash the old postmodern arguments. It's not necessarily wrong to address these issues, but you can't address them making assumptions. You can't address them in a careless or unsophisticated way. That's what's so wrong with so much design research. Um, people, you know, they, they just read something and then they take it as, as a given that everybody agrees with or assents to. So all of a sudden, um, you, you see this, you know, mumbo jumbo that might have once been Foucault or gobbledygook that they make out of Derrida. One of the things I have to say, is if you read Derrida, he is an interesting and thoughtful fellow. If you read a lot of the people who draw on Derrida, it's nonsense because they turn him into, <laughs> into something that he never was and never said. So style, what's the best way to write academic prose? The best way to narrate research? Well, there is no best way. There's your way. But when you do it your way, you got to give real thought to the issues and state them clearly to your readers. There is a fellow named Ernest Boyer who created a model of scholarship based on four categories. The scholarship of discovery, original research to advance knowledge, including basic research, applied research, and even clinical research. Then there's the scholarship of integration to synthesize information across disciplines, across topics within a di discipline or across time. There's the scholarship of engagement, using research expertise for broader purposes, such as public policy or service of some kind. And then finally, the scholarship of teaching and learning, systematic study of teaching and learning processes. Work in this, however, must be public, open to peer review and criticism, and it should be reproducible. 
and open to extension by other scholars. This is what makes it scholarship of teaching and learning rather than simply teaching and learning, which is also important, but it's not the scholarship. I think there's one crucial element in transparency that for me is a central foundation for all research because it gives you the basics for whatever you do next. And this is documentation. I, one of my doctoral professors, her name was Dorothy Harris. <laughs> I will never forget her because she ended every other lecture. She ended with a little motto, be true to your sources and your sources will be true to you. And by that she meant, if you're careful with your sources and you build on them properly, you can't go wrong. You may be mistaken in your interpretations. You may revise your thinking, but you'll always be on solid footing. You've got to ensure that those whom you represent, those whom you quote or cite, you do it fairly. Because when you quote someone or you cite them, their words belong to them, not to you. If you say, Sigmund Freud says this, or Paul Ricoeur says that, and you quote them, you've got to get it right. And that's whether you paraphrase them or quote them directly. Same thing, an indirect quote is still the same. You got to show where it comes from, and you got to demonstrate that this is what Ricoeur really said. I was just reading an article together with, with a colleague, um, which supposedly developed Ricoeur's ideas of metaphor for film criticism, but it completely got it wrong, and then basically leaped off into um, Jungian analysis, which has nothing to do with Ricoeur. And this is really, really a shame because you can do an awful lot with Ricoeur. Uh, they came to my colleague because she actually used Ricoeur for film analysis and they somehow found her and said, please review this paper. And she showed it to me and we looked at it together. I was just scratching my head the whole time. Uh, she finally got the review done, but it was, it was puzzling. Um, if you as a scholar or thinker say that somebody says something, you've got to read clearly what they've said and represented. Then you can say, well, I actually don't agree with Ricoeur on this, or I do agree with Ricoeur. And here's what I have to say. Um, Oh, hang on. I just got to check something in the chat. Um, if you look in the chat, Carl van der Varde uh, gave links about Maria Bunche and Ernest Boyer from Wikipedia. They've got some decent little articles about them, he says, but be careful because they should be separate links. So you can also go into Wikipedia and just look for each of them. Um, anyhow, the other thing, of course, is you should acknowledge those whose ideas contribute to your work. Um, whether you agree or not, and it's often useful to have somebody great to disagree with. Um, there was an interesting, I was just suddenly thinking, um, about this. I'll, I'll come back to it. It just suddenly reminded me of something and I can't quite get my finger on it. At any rate, there may be other kinds of research transparency that I haven't thought of, and I will uh, welcome any suggestions you may have for me. That's it for now. Ah, I remember now. Um, I 
think it was Niels Bohr, but I'm not sure, who said there are the opposite of a small truth is a falsehood. The opposite of a great truth may be another great truth. I've got to remember who said it, but it was an interesting, it just suddenly occurred to me when I was <laughs> thinking about these guys. Okay, I think that's it for now. Uh, as I say, I'll welcome any other thoughts you might want to send my way about transparency. Um, and I'm happy to uh, start with questions. Okay, thank you so much, Professor, for these inspiring moments. I have here with me the, the list of questions that uh, we shared with you previously. These uh, questions came from our students and also our colleagues. It's a little hard to hear you from the distance. Okay, uh, <coughs> microphone is working now. And now it's better? Yes, now it's good. Okay, so I'm, I moved to, uh, next to my computer, sorry, because I was using a, a different uh, microphone. So I was uh, thanking you for this inspiring um, uh, talk. And I was saying that I have with me a list of questions that we previously shared with you. The questions are coming from uh, our students and colleagues. So without any particular order, since they were organized in a random way, I would start from, from the, the very first one I have in, the, in the, the paper. So this question is, how do you view the role of design in the 21st century? What are the challenges and opportunities for tomorrow's designers? Yeah. Uh I have to say, this is almost too big to answer. I mean, I, we could start now and still be talking tomorrow. Um, there was an interesting article by Richard Buchanan in which he spoke about the four orders of design. Um, and the fourth order of design involves the social design and, and systemic design. And we're talking about wide ranges of skills. So, of course, the first two orders, we're talking about pretty much the same kind of um, the same kind of thing um, that we've always been talking about, but at a deeper and more sophisticated level. Uh, for example, we know a great deal more about graphic design and communication design now than we did 50 years ago. Uh, research pushes us forward. Information is deeper and more sophisticated. There's an article coming up in Shaji in the next issue by the great Canadian designer or Argentinian and Canadian designer, uh, Jorge Frascara. And he talks about many of these issues and points to the things that we've learned over the past 50 years. But when he first wrote on this specific topic back in the early 1970s, it took him two years to persuade the editors of Design Issues, the leading design journal at the time, to publish an article about research and its importance in graphic design as contrasted with simple style or aesthetics. The notion that we design things for a purpose and the design we work with must be suited to the purpose. Well, when you get to social design, systemic design and social design, then it becomes genuinely difficult because you need ranges of skills that may involve other disciplines frequently do involve other disciplines. Um, one of the real plagues of design research and design education are people who convene workshops at design schools and they get a bunch of um, post-its up on, on a whiteboard and figure, well, now 
now we now we've solved problems like world hunger or or piracy and of course this is not so one of the real problems for example i i know a number of different designers who actually have worked on very difficult and complicated problems um there was one group of anthropologists and sociologists in an organization um that did an enormous amount of work for the United Nations, uh, often in real conflict situations. Every year they had to take a refresher course of you know, how to survive in a hot zone where people are firing at each other. And uh, they had to wear bulletproof vests and the whole thing. And finally, he just gave up. He closed his, the reason he gave up, it was really interesting, just to relax and make life pleasant for himself in his off hours, he wrote detective novels. Then he sold one of the detective novels. And um, then he sold another, he got a contract, and then he started to sell options for movies. And he was making a great living from his novels. So he completely left the design business. He stopped working for the UN. They closed the organization. And I was talking with him about this once. And he said that somebody, um, was saying to him, you know, but now you can't solve these important problems. And he said, you know, when I worked for the UN, I couldn't solve those problems either. Uh, the people who were the low level bureaucrats were afraid to make any decisions. And the people who were senior enough to have a position where they could make decisions, spent all their time on politics and self-serving opportunity seeking for their next big job within the UN. And he said, so basically, we suffered. We worked on real problems that could have made a difference. But the people who should have been working with us and making things happen wouldn't. So he says, you're absolutely right. I write detective novels now. And I don't make a difference to the world. But at least I don't suffer every day working on stuff that should work and can't because idiots won't work with it, won't even try to see what will happen. I knew another guy who did some of the same kind of stuff, and he, he quit for the same reasons. He, was, he worked with the Justice Department. He, was, he worked in the Obama White House, and uh, he was a serial entrepreneur and invented many interesting things and some companies that make a lot of money. Um, but he got out of the uh, social design area because it often involves stuff that you simply can't do. So there's the four orders of design, but asking what design should be in the 21st century it is framed by very difficult and challenging problems. And like I say, if we were really to look into this, we'd be here for two weeks and we still wouldn't get to an answer. Okay, thank you so much, Professor. Somehow related with, with this um, first question, there's another one that says, have we designers finally reached that point of harmfulness described by Papanek? And if so, what can bring us back on tracks to address and contribute positively to the world? So it's kind of related with the first one. Yeah, well, the truth is Papanek was right and he's still right. The difficulty is the problems that he portrays in his books can't normally be solved by designers because designers normally don't sit in the executive level of the companies that demand design projects. So sometimes people do stupid things because they have to make a living. Other times, they do good things because they have to make a living, but they still don't make the decisions um, about what a company will produce, how the company will market it. So, oh, we are still exactly where, in that sense, we're still exactly where Papanek said we were. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor. There's a, uh, another question that adds a little bit on the 
tech, tech parts of the, the world is this transition to the digitalization. Okay, and so the question says, considering the advent of digital world in our societies and the current challenge we face, like climate emergency, economic crisis, and social political unstable world, in which way would you review your strategic design taxonomy proposal and the knowledge domains every design should know? This one is tricky. I think the taxonomy is, is still pretty reasonable, but what I'm not sure about is what every designer should know. Um, when I wrote that taxonomy, first it was 1992 and I would have to say, <laughs> I, I was not quite as consciously incompetent as I should have been. So analytically, it's an interesting tool, but knowledge has expanded and deepened so far that the only thing that I'm, I'm, I'm certain these days uh, every designer should know is that range of thinking and learning skills in the very first the very first column of the taxonomy. But for the rest, specialization has um, increased so much. Everyone needs to know how to think. Everyone should be aware of rhetoric, logic, and analysis. But not everybody needs to know every kind of design skill. That would depend on your, your field and your specialization. Okay, thank you so much. There's a, another question. Is, uh, since you were once part of Fluxus, how do you view experimental and conceptual practices of design today, such as speculative and critical design? Uh, I, I have to say that a lot of it's interesting to think about. Um, I, I've been about a, a couple of years ago now, um, John Hanhart edited a, a book of Nam Jun Paik's complete writings for um, the MIT Press. And I read this book and I think, boy, this guy really knew what he was talking about. Well, if you look at events and event scores, uh, Nam Jun's work, George Brecht's work, a lot of this in some way touches on speculative design or critical design. So there's some kind of link, uh, but Fluxus was both a lot more fluid and often um, more philosophical because <coughs> it wasn't necessarily working with design, but looking at larger or more ambiguous issues. Uh, if, if you're curious, there is an interesting article in a recent issue of Shaji, it's about a year old now, in which the two authors talk about thought experiments and they link thought experiments in physics, in philosophy and in art to both design and to critical and speculative design. Uh, it's an interesting article. I'd suggest it's worth reading. The relationship between fluxus and speculative design, uh, like I say, there's something there, but I'm not quite sure what it is. <laughs> okay. Okay, change the, the scope a little bit. Let's look into the uh, education part of the the design field. So is there a chance of the design field may become a transversal class in every university? I don't think it's very likely. I think there's a couple universities that are trying something like this, uh, making, for example, an undergraduate major or an undergraduate minor in design available. Um, Case Doris worked on something like this at University of Technology, Sydney, but I don't know what um, 
what finally happened to it. Um, there's something like this at University of California at San Diego. Every university, it's, it's unlikely. There's nearly nothing that every university agrees to do. And half of the time, whatever one of them agrees to do today, by the time six other universities adopt it, there's a new vice president or a new chancellor or vice chancellor who decides we're going to do something different at our place now. So that, that idea was great, but it's out. Okay. And what about this uh, digital transition? So classes are becoming more and more in, uh, being taught in hybrid models. We are experienced those uh, in the recent uh, days and maybe we consider to keep it like that in the future. Do you think this uh, will uh, affect the design education? Uh, well, I think in one way it has to because these hybrid models, uh, they, they do work often, but whether they do work or they don't work, a lot of universities have realized they can save an enormous amount of money by using them. And still other universities figured out ways that they could make money by using them. Because instead of having students from one city who show up and work in one place, they can have students from any number of cities around the world who um, <laughs> who don't show up, but they still pay money. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But another question here is uh, related with this uh, interdisciplinary and maybe transdisciplinary approach. And for instance, to give you the example of Yad here, we are trying to combine this, this cross uh, uh, events, bringing up uh, a lot of areas into the, into the, to the project. And so uh, considering this uh, transdisciplinary or multidisciplinary nature of uh, design, how can we enhance collaborative and integrated learning focus on problem solving? Uh, well, th 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 there's two answers. Basically, I think this is quite right. Um, this is a significant and necessary kind of step, but the specifics about how to enhance it, again, that gets down to um, details. And it always depends upon the subject, the topic, and especially the kind of problem that you're trying to solve when you're designing something or when you're, when you're solving a problem. The kind of problem you wanna solve is often central to the choices you make. Just as in science, the kind of problem you're trying to solve determines the sort of methods that you wanna try. And even then you might not necessarily, um, it might not work, but at least you, you start with an idea of how to solve it. Um, one of the great all time books that um, in terms of just problem solving in general. There's a tremendous book by a guy named Polya, P-O-L-Y-A, G. Polya. Um, and it was published and reprinted many times by Princeton University Press. The guy is essentially, he's a mathematician. And the book shows you step-by-step step, different ways to take problems apart, different ways to try to solve them. Um, and I would say if I was going to recommend only one key book to start with for people working with programs like this and for the students in them, I'd, uh, I'd suggest Polya's book, How to Solve It. Okay. So before I open the discussion to the, to the audience, I have here a very last question from our students. So it's, it, they ask, if design researchers study design, shouldn't we call them designologists? In other words, 
would it be useful to distinguish between a design fractioneer, so someone that produces new artifacts, and a design researcher, someone who produces theory or data? Well, in today's world, I, I don't think it's necessarily useful to distinguish this because uh, some of the really outstanding people that I know in the design field actually do both. Uh, you know, if you're talking about the absolute top of the game, look at a guy like Don Norman. And if you're talking about, um, you know, normal, real first rate human beings, because Don's abnormal, <laughs> he's, he's worked in so many different fields. Um, but for example, one of the guy who keeps posting interesting thoughts to, um, to, the, to the chat, Carl van der Varde. Uh, Carl's tremendous. He's, he's a real researcher, but he's also designed an awful lot of stuff that actually works. So is he a design researcher? Is he a design practitioner? He's both. And both of these elements give genuine depth to each of his fields. Or another guy I mentioned, um, I mentioned Case Dorst, who is in Australia now. Case, um, well, Case is an interesting character because he was a very successful design practitioner, but design in the Netherlands changed as, as an industry. And it became very difficult for small practitioners with little one and two people firms to stay in business. So somehow Case transitioned over. He still does consulting, but one of the things that makes his theorizing so good is that Case was a real practitioner. Or another example for me, the again, one of the absolute uh, great designers in my pantheon, is Per Mollerup, the Danish graphic designer. Per um, had what was the best small design company in Denmark. And it, the firm was usually somewhere between eight people and 12 people, depending on how many employees he needed for projects. But um, Finally, one day he said, you know, he was doing a lot of research. He, over the years, he had written any number of fabulous books and just working part time. He got his doctorate and uh, wrote a brilliant thesis that then became a best selling book. And one day, Per, you know, decided he liked research and he was going crazy running a small firm because he was spending more time bringing in projects so that he could keep his people employed, then he was spending doing the actual work and he got an opportunity to become a professor. So he just moved over, but I can tell you he, oh, and but what's interesting also is before he became a designer, he was a statistician and he taught statistics at a business school. So he's got a multiple talent, both in research and in design practice. Um, and both sides made him who he, who he is or who he became. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that we need to distinguish. I'd say the very best people do both. Okay, thank you so much, fantastic. I'm going to open the questions to the audience here uh, in the room. So is there uh, anyone? With the uh, new questions for Professor Ken Friedman, please just raise your hand and I will be happy to give you the microphone. Yeah. So, my, my question is um, what is the role you see for biology in this field? For what? Biology. Biology. Uh, it's an interesting question because one of the things that I know, I actually uh, talked about this in a, in a paper some years ago 
with the new kinds of design that have become possible. Very clearly, um, we can now design biological things. We can design artificial meat. We can design new kinds of life forms. But this is something where I am definitely aware of how much I don't know. So I can't tell you what the role is because to do biological design, you need a very different kind of training. Um, I mean, you can play with it. For example, there's an interesting artist, Eduardo Koch. He, he's, he's a professor at the Art Institute of Chicago and he designs things, but the stuff he designs, it's like playful artworks. And I'm not even sure that I approve ethically of some of the designs. Like he designed a, um, a green fluorescent bunny rabbit. And I don't know. I think you have to really reflect deeply on what it is that you do. There's a lot of stuff that we can do in every single field, but that doesn't mean that we should do it. And where it comes to design and biology, I think this is one of the fields that takes deep reflection of designing a steak that you can print or a hamburger without meat made out of vegetables. I, I can't see a problem with that, but there's an awful lot of things that we're talking about designing that are extremely problematic. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, here behind me. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hello? Yes. Can you hear me? So I want to go back to the question of transparency. And I want to know if because you said that transparency has a physical quality and that transparency has an ethical quality. And I would like to know if you see that there, where's the relation between these two qualities and if this is something that manifests uh, you know, the relation between the physical quality and the ethical quality. Is it something that, has, that manifests in your in your in, in design of like products. Maybe. Yeah, that that's tricky. And I, I don't think I have a, a clear answer because when you talk about the physical quality of transparency, um, when it gets to research, it's really a metaphor um, that you should be able to see and understand what you're looking at. Uh, but the ethical issues are about the decisions that people make as researchers. And uh, so it, it's something that <laughs> I, I'm not quite sure that I can answer very well in a short time. Because the, the, as I say, the physical element for the most part is, is metaphorical when it comes to research. May, may I have something? It came to my mind the idea of the deception while dealing with the more experimental studies. That's sometimes tricky. Why? Because you can't tell the participants everything about the purpose of the study. And that might create some deception uh, afterwards. And that raises sometimes ethical issues. So maybe there are situations in which researchers cannot be all the time as transparent <laughs> as they should. And so this is also interesting to, to look at. I don't know, what's just a thought. Uh, other, other questions? Yes, please, uh, another question. Can you hear me? So uh, coming again to the, the, Sorry, effort. can't hear you. <laughs> I'm trying to raise up my voice, but it is really low. Can you hear me? Or otherwise I... What is going You can come here next to the computer. Maybe it's better. Sorry. Okay. 
Okay, it's better now? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, when you were mentioning uh, style, speaking about transparency in research, I were mentioning in my mind, uh, you know, with the 99 way to rewrite the same things and then coming to the exercise this time. But what I'm asking you um, is probably also not just a matter of style, but also a matter of language, because that issue of the transdisciplinary approach of design recalls in action a multiple area, scientific area, with different languages, specific, scientific. And so that could give us such an entropy, I don't know what to say, and also not transparency results as well. Yeah, I, I missed some of that. Yeah. Can I try uh, just to uh, ask you if there's some relationship in between style that you mentioned regarding the, mm, the needs to be uh, consistent in transparency in research with our publication, where you were speaking about publication, <laughs> and then uh, the property of the language that we use and we express in our publication. Ah, okay. Well, you know, this, in a way, this is something that I deal with all the time. As a journal editor, um, Sheji is interdisciplinary. So we know we have readers coming from many, many fields. As a result, we ask our writers to write in a way that is understandable to intelligent people who don't know the field that the author comes from. Uh, this, in many, many fields, many journals, for example, articles are filled with jargon because jargon is useful shorthand. So if you're writing a journal article and you're only writing to other mathematicians, you can use the jargon of mathematics, you can use abbreviations that make no sense to anybody else, and all of your presumed readers will understand you. But if you're dealing with an interdisciplinary audience, you've got to, you've got to be clear for everybody. Uh, we, we ask people to use only the abbreviations that you'd find in newspapers like the New York Times or the Guardian, uh, abbreviations that everybody understands like UN and NATO and UNESCO or PhD. Everybody knows those, but there's plenty of abbreviations that people don't know. And we tell people can't do it uh, because if people are reading, even if you explain the abbreviation the first time you see it in an article like SD for strategic design, um, every time they see a non-standard abbreviation, they have to stop and think back and remember what it was. And that interrupts the flow of thought, which means that the article becomes less comprehensible. Um, there's a very funny point that Stephen Hawking made in his book, A Brief History of Time. And he said his editor told him that every, abbrevi every formula, every scientific formula you put in a book will cut your readership by 50%. So the only scientific formula that appeared in that book was Einstein's formula, E equals MC squared. And he explained it, but of course, people don't feel afraid of it because it's been in every newspaper in the world by now. Um, so language makes a big difference to the degree that you can learn to write clearly and across disciplines. It creates transparency because people can understand what you're saying. Another point for that matter is uh, the way you write. For the most part, 
if you listen to the way I speak and you read the way I write, for the most part, I use words of only one or two syllables. Um, if there are words that cannot be said in only one or two syllables, I may use more. For example, the word syllable and the word example, but everybody knows example, so it's not a, it's not a tough one. But for the most part, I use straightforward language, active verbs, um, active verbs in the ordinary sentence flow, subject, verb, object. Basically, I apply the, um, the, the, the old strunk and white rules. You know, people tell me, well, strunk and white, it's so boring. I don't want to write that way. Well, I want people to understand me. So I do write that way. And uh, this is how we create transparency through language. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. We are uh, reaching uh, the time limit of this lecture, but I can see there are some uh, people participating uh, in the, from the remote audience that want to intervene. So I can see Francesco Galli raise the hand. I don't know, Francesco, are you still with us? There's any question for Professor uh, Ken Friedman? Absolutely, yes. Thanks so much, Emilia, and uh, thanks so much also for giving me possibility. Uh, Professor Ken, I, I, I wrote in the chat my point, and uh, I also I, I use the reference of the philosopher, the Asian philosopher Bai Chulan, with the book Transparency in Society, because uh, you provoke us to reflect on transparency. And in the book, Bai Chulan assume that the transparency society, the Western transparency society, is a pornography. Because if it's evidence-based, means that if there is an evidence, means that we want to sell something. And that's why I provoke the conversation, and that is my question. Maybe uh, transparency research is a pornography research. Uh, uh, that is my point, and also thanks so much to the, the professor that shared the link of Bai Chulan that, uh, that uh, also can be useful for the student. And let me conclude that I absolutely understand that Professor Ken Friedman used the reference of Mario Bunge, uh, but Mario Bunge allowed me to consider that uh, his thinking is marked by rationalism, scientific realism, materialism, and what we can call consequentialism. Uh, and this is correct, design is also related to this, uh, but maybe, Professor, we have uh, uh, the chance for the future to open to something like uh, totally not rationalist. This is my point. And thanks so much for the time that you give to me. And I still remember the beautiful dinner that you offered to me in 2008 when I was a young scholar at RMIT with you. Thanks so much. Yeah, well, um... I've got to actually read Byung Chul Han. I haven't read him. Um, I'm not sure if well, in a way, it, it might be right. I mean, I'm I'm thinking even just right as I'm as I'm as I'm trying to answer. Um, it could be that. researchers are trying to sell something because they 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 have an hypothesis they they reach a position and then you try to convince other people that your position is reasonable so um in fact there's a wonderful book called return to reason by the british physicist and philosopher of science. Ah, I'm trying to recall his name. The title is Return to Reason. You will find it in, um, in Amazon. But he is saying not all reason is rationalism. You can make reasonable arguments without necessarily being a rationalist. Now, Bunke is an interesting fellow because um, he's both a physicist and a philosopher. Yes, yeah, Stephen Toulman, that's it. Uh, absolutely. Um, and 
as a philosopher, he doesn't demand that everybody should treat all things in the ways that physicists treat things. Uh, his, his, he's also a philosopher of social science, and he points out that there are lots of things that you can't, you can't treat in the way that physicists treat them and make sense. Uh, is he a consequentialist? Maybe, and a realist, but not necessarily a rationalist in every, in every respect. <laughs> um, oh yeah, there's also a book, uh, The Uses of Argument, that is by Stephen Toulman, a uh, wonderful thinker, wonderful writer. Um, but um, I don't know, you know, I mean, like I say, you, you raised a tremendously interesting question and I'm only just not thinking about it. So that's all I could say for the moment. Okay, thank you, Professor. Thanks There's so much. Uh, another, another colleague that raised hand and Ana Margarida. Hello. Are you with us? Yes, yes? please, you thank you. Yeah. You. Okay, so first of all, thank you, Professor Kim Friedman. It's a pleasure to have you with us. And thank you for your inspiring lecture and so important references as usual. So uh, I would like to come back to your cycle, this kind of uh, experience learning and so, uh, and so on cycle. And I would like to, to ask you something in a kind of um, just a, a, a issue that I'm thinking uh, along for now, that is considering these two, uh, these four phases that you have, and considering mostly uh, the third from conscious competence to unconscious competence that I fully agree. That is when the things are quite come mechanics in a way. So we don't think about it, we just do it. Uh, my question is uh, if we keep learning and challenge ourselves and I'm thinking about um, what we do, that is uh, keeping working and being with young people, with new interests, with new challenges that bring to the table. Don't you think that we can, in a way, extend our conscious competence moment, not going to the other because we are always learning and challenge ourselves? What do you think about it? Do you think it could be a way? Oh yeah, no, I mean, obviously, I think you're, you're quite right. We do, we do extend our conscious competence by interacting with other people. But a lot of the time, when you're a researcher and you start to deal with new things, you still have to go through the cycle. Um, so you have to be at least consciously incompetent some of the time in order to expand because if you're always consciously competent, you're not doing anything new. I mean, I can think of something. I made, I made a recipe <laughs> about a week ago. I, I, made, I made a new cod recipe that I'd never tried before. And I screwed it up totally. It was awful. My wife nearly shot me um, because I did some stupid things. I didn't quite, I didn't get it right. But now I understand what I did wrong. And now I'm going to try it again in a couple of weeks and see what I can do. But if I hadn't done it wrong, if I hadn't tried something completely new and, and mis misread it, because I was also reading the recipe in Swedish and the type was very small and I got it wrong. So you still have, <laughs> you, still, you still have to go through the, Yes. The phases sometimes. Yes. Because, because otherwise you, you're not trying something new. Yes, not l learning nothing from it, probably. But I still believe that, uh, nevertheless, we reduce the, the loop. That is, the, the left we become um, quick and in a quite iterative way, as we know, will become more effective and small cycles because we improve by experience. 
right? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I will keep trying to do so, extending this space. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Is uh, there any other questions for now? I'm sure that you will have plenty of questions later on, but for now, since we are about to finish this session. Okay, so not from the room, I don't know from the virtual rooms, there any other question before we end the session? If I may, Emilia, only if I may. Eh? Okay. Professor Ken Friedman, allow me, allow me to, to do this question. I absolutely admire you and understand that you are doing a transparency research in Sheji and in Tonji. But, a speculation, do you really think that the government, the Chinese government, that put the money on this project is so transparent, like your research that you're trying to do? That is my question. I don't know if you understand that. Eh? I will say that I enjoy very much working with my colleagues at Tongji and the government has been very fair and good to us. That's all I can say, please. Thanks so much, thanks so much. Come on, Sean. Okay, I, I can not see here Ozana, she's a... Uh... Asking something through the chat. Oksana, do you, do you want to yes. put the question orally? Yes, thank you. Yeah, so uh, when when I was thinking that when, I don't know, seeing this concept of transparency, it comes to mind the, yeah, the concept of evidence in a way and traceability and, and, and all of this. So I was wondering, what do you think of the role of evidence in design or the concept of, evidence-based design for a design process? Is it only a, a matter of, of research or do you see something beyond like, let's say research and yeah, using the scientific method or, yeah. <laughs> well, I thought a bit about evidence-based design some years ago. Uh, David Derling, uh, a good friend of mine from England, um, was working with the idea. And then we were sort of thinking about it in relation to evidence-based medicine. But to be honest, uh, he seems to have changed his mind about it a bit. And I haven't given it enough, enough thought to say so much. I, I'm sorry if that sounds dumb, but it's better just to say I haven't thought about it so much. Yes. Uh, could you uh, write the name of the person that was working on, on that? It was D David Darling. Uh, wait, wait a second. I'll write it. No, thank you. Thank you very That's much. Right. <laughs> thank you. Okay. So if there are no more questions, then I will thank you all for these uh, uh, interesting uh, moments and for sharing your thoughts with us and for inspiring us. And let's uh, keep uh, in touch. And I hope you can benefit from the, the experience being shared during this event. And Professor, uh, I would like to once again to thank you. And there's no, no words that I can use to to thank you for your availability and for your kindness to, to share your time with us here at YAV and for others that join us as well. Thank you so much for contributing for this event and for uh, contributing for the design uh, area as well. So, okay, thank well, you. Yes, thanks, Professor. Thank you so much. And I hope I, we can see each other soon. Stay well, everybody. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow for the others that uh, keep with us on this uh, week. Thank you, Professor. Bye-bye. See you.